Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now, did you get down to, was it verse 14? You remember? Was that it? Okay, thank you. All right, then let's uh, stand and then we'll read then from verse 15 to the end. 15 to the end. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God as he tempted him in Massa. Ye shall diligently keep the Lord the commandments of the Lord your God and his statute, his testimonies and his statutes which he hath commanded thee. And thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest go in and possess the land of which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, to cast out all thine enemies from before thee. As the Lord hath spoken. And when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What meaneth the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God hath commanded you? Then thou shalt say unto thy son, We, we were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders great and sore upon Egypt and upon Pharaoh and upon all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from thence that he might bring us in to give us the land which he swear unto our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. All right, let's pray. For well, Father, we thank you now so much for the day. Uh, Lord, we thank you for uh, waking us up in the strength and being in sound mind, the ability to travel here, to have a local church. We thank you for the word of God that we can read, memorize, and meditate upon, and practice and follow. Uh, Lord, and we ask your blessing now to be on this time as we meet together, not just here in this class, but Brother Ed and Sister Brenda as they teach their classes. Lord, that the word might be passed down and that we might be strengthened. Uh, Lord, to love you and follow you with all of our heart, soul, and mind. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's be seated. Amen. Now, I have a... Uh, A note, I think it was, um, you got down through 16, I think it was, if I'm not mistaken. I, that's my note, that you came down through verse 16. Uh, I passed. Would that be right? I think you did 14 to 16 last week, didn't you? Yes, all right, all right, okay, okay. There's no need for me to go back over that then. Now, again, we want to remember our... Uh, Context, uh, there they are right there on the border, getting ready to cross the River Jordan. Now these, uh, these people have seen their uh, fathers and grandfathers and grandmothers and mothers, brothers, uncles pass away uh, because of their disobedience to the Lord. They wanted to... Uh, uh, 38 and a half years in the desert, so now Moses is going over and uh, 
reintroducing them to the commandments of God and their responsibilities before God is now they're being brought right now to the to the brink of the fulfillment of the promise that God had made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he'd bring them in uh, to this land. And so now God's uh, promises are coming true, just like they always do. Um, and so uh, he's making sure now that they understand these commandments and these statutes, these judgments, these testimonies, because it's important, because God delivered them uh, for a reason. God always delivers us for a reason. And when you read through the Psalms, uh, you'll see that um, not only is salvation something that you and I know it is on this side of the cross, um, as we are spiritually saved, the soul is converted, again, we're redeemed by the blood, we're made a new man. But then you see a lot in the Old Testament where the word salvation is used as physical salvation. Amen. God is saving them physically from uh, their enemies, from their distresses, from their turmoil, from pestilence, from disease, so forth and so on. So that also is true, you know, in our life. Not only do we need to be saved physically, but there are times in our life we, I mean, sal spiritually, but there are times in our life we need physical salvation too. And when we witness to people, we see a lot of times they have uh, that physical salvation, you know, confused with spiritual salvation. When you ask them, have you been saved? Well, then they'll recount to you sometimes when maybe they almost drowned or when they were spared in a rollover. I remember a young man visited the church. He, he said that he knew he was saved because uh, he was leaving Monroe going down 75 there, and he experienced a a rollover. His car rolled over three times. I don't know what happened. Somebody hit him and his vehicle rolled over three times. But yet he was able to walk away from it. No, nothing. Nothing was wrong with him. So he knew that uh, God had spared him at that time. And of course that's true. He did. But that was the Lord physically sparing him. And of course um, a reason was again the Lord definitely wanted him to come to know him as Lord and Savior to be born again. You know, as far as I know, that young man has not received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He was a uh, Roman Catholic, you know, so he was having difficulty uh, with the de seeing the distinction between the Catholic Church and just the plain Bible, amen, because there's a lot. Of course, the devil deceived him, you know. <laughs> So here they are getting ready to go in. And so Moses saying, well, look now, here it is. So let's pick it up, verse 17. And he said, you shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes, which he hath commanded you. So again, it's not something that you were to be indifferent toward or just something that you were to put part time. It was something that they were to be diligent about. See, diligent about these things of keeping and be uh, really mindful of them. We read earlier in the chapter where um, in verse 8 it said, Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between their eyes. In other words, they were supposed to be so on the mind that, you know, were supposed to guide what their hands did. They were supposed to see things, you know, the way the Lord saw them. They were to diligently uh, keep them. Again, that's why the Bible always, uh, you know, encourages us and ad admonishes us that we should be meditating upon the word, upon the law, upon the word of God. Day and night, we should be thinking about it because that helps us diligently keep it, to have it ever before our mind, in our heart, mind, and thinking about it. It's something that we're to be diligent about. Again, uh, this thing of living uh, for the Lord is not just... Um, Something that we do on Sunday or Thursday. It's supposed to be something that you are doing every day. See, again, and as we see now, these statutes, these commandments, these testimonies, these laws were meant for their everyday life. See, not just for a time when they would come and gather together, not just their Sabbath days or the feast days, which are Sabbaths of the Lord, but it was meant to be every day. Amen. The word of God is to have that type of control 
in our life every day, then notice again that uh, it's a voluntary thing. In other words, uh, you know, we sing that song, volunteer, who wants to be a volunteer. Well, again, that's something that you do. Amen. You diligently keep these things. And it's a hard matter. See? It's a matter of the heart. You should diligently keep. See, guard, obey the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes, which he hath commanded thee. And again, I know we do emphasize it over and over again, and it's really just for our encouragement. You know, if you don't have the commandments and statutes and testimonies of the Lord, if you're not sure you have them, then how could you really keep them? See, how could you be diligent about keeping them if you're not quite sure that you have them? Did the Lord really say that? Is that what we really should do? I was, uh, you know, I pressed online. The trumpet was online. I pressed uh, the trumpet there, and they had a, an article about uh, a preacher that was preaching a funeral of a man, and he just went on to tell everybody that, uh, you know, that it was a, a joke to think that this man died and went to hell, or he died and went to heaven, because there is no such thing as hell. There is no such thing as heaven. And, he, and I didn't look at the video. They had it, but I didn't look at it. I just read the article. And uh, he was getting a positive response from the crowd, you know, that that's the truth. In other words, his idea was there is no God didn't give us a Bible to tell us how to stay out of hell and how to go to heaven, but how to have our heaven or hell here on earth. In other words, he's not really interested in heaven or hell, but he was interested in being good and uh, living good and seeking good. And, you know, a lot of you know people in church, you know, not even good. And, um, and so he was going on that, and, uh, but I'm sure he got that way because somehow or another down the line, he became convinced he didn't have a Bible. Amen? And so he was just going to do the best he thought he should do of what the Bible meant. I've seen another uh, example of that. This was a true story. It was a documentary on, um, well, it was a movie on Netflix about a, a, a high ranking, I forget the gentleman's name now. But it was a high-ranking uh, Pentecostal preacher. He was holding revivals all over uh, the country. Uh, had a huge church, uh, very well respected. And um, it was during the time they were having that genocide in Rwanda, the Hootsies and the Tootsies killing each other. And if you ever get a chance to see Hotel Rwanda, I think that was, it really explains what that was and all of the murdering hundreds of thousands of people killed, hundreds of thousands uh, killed there. And so he was looking at that on all the news reports and, and he just started to weep. He said, well, these people don't know Jesus. And then he said, how could a loving God let all these people die without knowing Jesus and going to hell? And from that thought, he then changed all of his doctrine um, that, um, that everybody's going to be saved because he couldn't fathom the thought that people, these, all of these people died and went to hell. One, you don't know if all of them died and went to hell. You know, well, I'm sure quite a few of them did. You know. um, and so he changed his entire doctrine. And he asked, you know, of course, and you can do that in those verses you can find. Universalism, you know, that everybody's going to be saved, including the devil. And he became a Unitarian. You know, eventually, of course, he lost, you know, the Pentecostals. They still believe in heaven and hell, most part, in the Bible. So he began preaching that. People began flocking out of that church left and right. He lost his church, you know, uh, his position within the denomination. Uh, I forgot what it was. It might have been Church of God. Um, but the Unitarians embraced him. You know, and then of course all the groups, you know, the homosexuals, the sodomites embraced him because everybody. It's just all about loving one another, see. Because there was a doctrine within the Bible he couldn't understand and stomach, so did he really have the word of God or not? See, did God really mean what he said? See, it really is a pretty big issue 
Well, of course, they had it right there. They knew it. Amen. They still had the man God used to dictate it to him. So he's standing right there talking to him. So they had it. Amen. So they knew. Verse 18. And thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord. Well, what's that? Well, obeying what verse 17 says. Amen. Thou shalt do that which is right and good in the Lord. Then be obedient to what the Bible said. Amen. Be obedient to what the commandment said. Be obedient to what the testimony said. What the statute said. See, be obedient. Do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord. See, always in the sight of the Lord. See, he's primary, not just in the sight of other men and women, not men pleasers, as the Bible said. What's right in the sight of the Lord? Again, we have to ask ourselves in our everyday dealings, uh, how does the Lord view what I'm doing? See, how is this in the eyes of the Lord? It may be okay between you and me, all right? It might be okay between your neighbors. It might be okay with your family. But is it okay with the Lord, see, in the sight of the Lord? Because uh, he is the one that we have to give an account to. He is the God, the true and living God. So we have to keep that foremost in our mind. Why? <clears throat> Verse 18, that it may be well with thee and thou mayest go in and possess the good land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers again here they were right on the brink of that if you can just kind of see what that must mean to them you know 400 years they'd be down in Egypt uh, as the Lord told Abraham then they come out with a mighty and high hand and now here they are right on the brink of fulfilling this promise that God had made to Abraham Isaac and Jacob they need to be obedient. Verse 19, to cast out all thine enemies from before thee as the Lord has spoken. Let's just turn back to Numbers chapter um, 33 and just look at what he says about these enemies. Look at Numbers 33, 50. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan near Jericho, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye are passed over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then ye shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you, and destroy all their pictures, and destroy all their molten images, and quite plug down all their high places. And ye shall dispose the inhabitants of the land, and dwell therein, for I have given it you the land to possess it. And ye shall divide the land by lot for an inheritance among your families, and to the the more you shall give the more inheritance, and to the fewer you shall give the less inheritance. Every man's inheritance shall be in the place where his lot falleth, according to the tribes of your fathers you shall inherit it. But if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which ye let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and shall vex you in the land wherein you dwell. More of it shall come to pass that I shall do unto you as I thought to do unto them. So again, these tribes, these seven nations, which he's going to mention in the very next chapter, chapter 7, were the enemies. And uh, the Lord gave them 400 years to get right. I think you can read that over in, in um, uh, Genesis chapter 15, where he said the cup of the Amorites was not yet full. Now, I thought it was interesting that he said the cup of the Amorites, because when you, when you get to chapter 7, you read it, it's seven nations mentioned. But in Genesis, he just mentioned the Amorites. So I was wondering, does the Amorites then mean all seven, or were they the last nation to apostatize? In other words, had all the rest of them by that time already gone down the tubes 
and was there something left with those Amorites? Now that thought just came to me this morning as I was looking through the Bible, but I've not followed through in studying about the Amorites themselves, um, you know, whether or not they, uh, whether that's true or not. It was just a thought that come to me, because God is particular. Now, he, he could have used that to mean all seven of them, but he is very particular. He did just mention the Amorites, so they may have been the last nation finally to give up and just say, we're not going to have anything to do, no vestige of knowledge of God whatsoever. And of course, as this part of the Bible, as they go in and destroy these seven nations, that really give a lot of people uh, trouble because they consider it to be genocide, and the Lord destroying everything down to the last man, woman, and child, and even uh, some of the cattle, uh, depending upon which particular city God would allow them to take the spoil. Some he would, some he wouldn't. Jericho, he wouldn't let them take anything, you know. Uh, and so it gives a lot of trouble. We say, go on and destroy uh, your enemies. Again, they were God's enemies. And again, we have to always remember at one time, again, they didn't know the Lord. Everybody knew the Lord. Everybody was uh, monotheistic. There was no, you know, uh, polytheistic gods until after the flood. Everybody was monotheistic. Everybody believed in one God until the flood. You know, then after that, then you find gods popping up. Uh, and of course, we uh, know they have to be connected with these fallen angels. And so when you, again, just previously up there, you know, God is speaking to them because I am a jealous God. You know that they weren't to have any other gods before them. And when they go into this land, they got all of these idols and all of these pictures and things which he told, which we read right there. You know, pluck them things down, bring them down, burn them. Don't leave anything standing. Uh, see. Uh, because, uh, you know, these particular people where we see these giants have been given over to these, uh, these fallen deities, these uh, hybrids, whatever you want to call these fallen angels. They were given over to that. And um, they just reached a point of no return. There could be nothing done to it. They were just completely infected throughout their whole society. It wasn't just that God that they didn't want to worship God, they were completely given over. And you can see that from uh, the um, uh, statements in Leviticus chapter 18, Leviticus chapter 20, what they did, how they did it, who they did it to. Um, you know, they were completely given over to this type of culture. In other words, the, uh, these fallen angels, these giants, and these things had an easy go. They just embraced this. And so really that cannot be left out of the statement why God said go in and destroy them. Again, when you think about, uh, again, I didn't necessarily uh, didn't see the God, but when you think about all of the earth, three quarters of the earth is underwater. 71 to 75 percent of it is all underwater. They haven't even begun to search out those things that are buried in the depths of the sea. God flooded this thing and buried something he didn't want known. See, and even then when, he, when we speak about it, uh, you know, again, we see the Bible truths about it, but it's really dark and it's really uh, evil and things like that. And he buried this stuff. And every now and then they find things down there uh, that are incredible. See, but God didn't want to know. He flooded the thing out. Worldwide flood. And so these were enemies and they were to go in and destroy these enemies and pluck down everything. And if they didn't do it, there would be pricks in their eyes and thorns in their sides. And of course, we saw that's what happened. They didn't do what the Lord told them to do. And they made treaties and they made, uh, which we'll read about, you know, if you get into you know, the book of Joshua, they made treaties and things with them. Uh, and decided that they live with them because it was a little bit easier than fighting them all the days of their life. And it cost them down the end, you know, caused them to stumble. Okay. So again, they had this thing of battle. Uh, can we go back to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6? They were going to be fighting and casting out. And of course, you know, you and I make a lot. We can get a lot of um, instruction in righteousness. We can make a lot of application. In our lives, you know, we're going to see down here a little later, the Lord redeemed them and brought them out of Egypt. And so 
that didn't set us on easy street, amen? In other words, things didn't become easier for us. Now we really entered into the battle. We didn't know there was a battle going on. We got saved. Now we realize, uh-oh, man, now we realize that we had been walking according to the prince of the power of the air. The Bible says walking according to the course of the world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Well, once we got saved, now all of a sudden we uh, got introduced to this war. And now we saw, man, this thing is a struggle. It's trying to live for the Lord and do right um, in every which way to do right. You know, uh, even Brother Bruce, we were just talking about, you know, tempted, you want to go work somewhere, but you know, easy. Maybe I can go work in the carry out, but everywhere you go, they're selling liquor. You know, it's just a fight. Everywhere you go, cigarettes, liquor, you know what I'm saying? Everywhere. Pornography. Selling that. I can't work in there. They're selling pornography in the store. You know, it's just like, man, it's a fight everywhere you go. Amen? Again, but uh, where to be in that battle? See, again, there's no discharge from war. And again, the scripture clearly in that context, uh, you know, we're all going to die. If the Lord don't call, if the trumpet don't call, if he don't rapture us out, we're all going to die. You know, and so we're going to be in this fight until the end. Amen. And so we can buckle it up and, you know, get our armor on and keep on swashbuckling for the Lord. Amen. But if we uh, retreat, uh, the enemy don't retreat, brother. Uh, He's going to keep coming, come right up underneath your door, come right in your house, get in your mind, get in your heart. He ain't going to retreat so, until you just cry uncle. So, uh, amen. You got to keep fighting. Verse 19, to cast out thine enemies from before thee, as the Lord hath spoken, as he hath spoken, time and time again, he continues to reference what did he say? Who did he say it to? What promises are there? And that's something you and I have to get in our mind as we're reading through now this precious part in Romans, preaching through that, and we're reading through the New Testament. You know, our hope is built upon what did he say? Amen. And, and, and God is not a man that he should lie. Amen. What has he promised us? Well, then can we claim that promises? Are we claiming on that promises? The song, Standing on the Promises. Of Christ my Lord, are we standing, you know, on those promises? Can we readily speak about those promises? Again, I have certain Bible verses, sections in the scripture. You know, I'm teaching my young, the young boys there in the Sunday school class that there has to be certain foundational passages in your life. In other words, there are certain passages you say, I'm, I'm going to build my life on these. Now, again, we have all of the Bible, but in order for it to be, to work, we have to be certain things I know I'm going to build my life on. Because sometimes you know, the, so the storms come, the winds beat, and everything else. And so I have a set of Bible verses that I know I can go back and and re uh, and speak to myself about and meditate on and tell to really settle my to settle myself down and to calm myself down. This is what the Lord has promised. This is what the Lord has said. See, uh, this is what He's spoken. This is what God said He would do. He is doing. He will do. See, it's all based upon the truthfulness. How truthful is God? See, how sure is He? He's very sure. Very true. Amen. And again, um, his word is very pure, the Bible says. Not just pure, but very pure. Psalms 119 is very pure. So that's the thing we come back to when everything gets kind of thrown out of kilter. You know, and it seems to be a lot of doubt. Come back to the word. Don't go to your own mind. See, come back to the word. Come back to the word, because you get lost in your mind, amen? You know, you know, a tangent will sneak out this way, and then a tangent will sneak out that way. Some will sneak out that way, and before you know it, you built this whole elaborate system. This is how it is! Well, you know, it's not anything like that, but, you know, we have the ability to do that in our mind. But now the Bible is clear, it's pure, it's right. And God can bring us back to center, amen, on his word. Now, I like what verse 20 says. And when thy son asketh thee in, thee in time to come, 
saying, What meaneth the testimonies and statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded thee? In other words, they were to be living in such a time, they have children right there, right now, that they didn't have any idea what they, why they were doing what they were doing. They were just following their dad and mom. See, we're going to go on to Rear Jordan. You know, we have these statutes, uh, what we're supposed to do for Passover, you know, what we're supposed to do for the Sabbath. See, well, they didn't understand any of that. They were just doing what dad and mom were doing. They were following it. But there was going to come a time in their life when their son would look at these things and say, well, why are we doing this? See, why are we doing this? And then you give them an answer. Why? And of course, the Lord told them exactly uh, what to tell them. And again, that's, um, you know, something that's important, again, in, in your life, in my life, for those of us who have young ones. You know, I don't have any young ones anymore. I have some grandchildren. Um, but, you know, I don't have any young ones. But it's going to come a time, like right now, they're young and your children really just doing what you do. Amen. That's what, mom, we go to church, we sing these hymns, we, we put money in the plate, you know. You give that gospel tract to the lady in the store. You're reading your Bible, but then they're going to come a time when they say, well, why do you do that, mama? Why do you do that, daddy? See? And, of course, that's the moment then you teach them why. Amen. This is why we do it. And I, re I really like that um, uh, because that's our responsibility. The Bible says at least to <clears throat> son and our son's son, that second generation, you know, to pass on why we do. We're to know why we do what we do. The Bible knows nothing of blind faith. Nothing at all. Why do you do? I know why I come to church. Amen. Amen. And I know why I will put money in the offering plate. I know why I gave, you know, a couple gospel tracts out yesterday. I know why I pray. Amen. I know why I don't do certain things. We're to have a why, and we're to know why. Again, God isn't uh, interested in people who are ignorant. Amen. The Bible calls us time and time, be not ignorant, brother, of certain things. Amen. Of course, again, this is the day and age in which we live. So many people are so ignorant, Christian people, of sound Bible doctrine. They're ignorant of that now, to no fault of their own because they're not getting much in the places that they're uh, going. I was talking to a dear friend of mine, Dave. He called me yesterday. Uh, we've known each other for years now. Um, you know, he took me out for Father's Day. We went to the Golden Corral. He's a dear friend, dear brother. Well, anyway, he was at the gym. He works. He lives on the east side. He's at the gym working at the, working out. And he asked. Uh, he was giving out a couple gospel tracks while he's in the gym. And the fellow said, oh, no, I don't need that. He said, yes, you do. You need it. And uh, he said, no, no, I'm saved. He said, oh. He said, well, praise the Lord. Uh, you know, I, now, for one, again, I, don't, I never understand a Christian rejecting a gospel track. Take the track. You know. Oh, praise God. Thank you so much for giving it to me. You know, I really appreciate your witness. And do that to encourage a person. Never say, oh, I ain't taking that. I'm saved. What? You know, and I tell them. And when they tell them, I say, well, then you take and pass it on. You know. And he said, oh, no. He said, I'm saved. And so he asked, he said, what church you go to? Well, he named it. He, know, he said he went to Cedar Creek, you know. And so the brother told him, he said, yeah, I went out there a couple of times with my sister. He said, but uh, he said, I took my Bible. He said, but I think I was the only one who had a Bible. He said, nobody had a Bible. He said, oh, no, we don't use that. Our, pra our pastor preaches on current things. You know, and then David, you know, he said, I didn't say nothing else to him, Brother Keeb. He said, I didn't know. What to say to be kind. You know, I was thinking a lot of things in my mind, but he didn't say anything. And I said, now, what a statement. No, we don't use that. Well, you don't even use the Bible at all. My pastor preaches on current things. Wow. So here's a whole, I mean, they got like five or six campuses all around Toledo, you know, Oregon, all over, you know, satellite churches, you know, where they play a video from the mother church. And uh, I mean, here's a whole... You know, thousands of people, they're not getting anything. You know, they're not getting any Bible whatsoever, amen? 
So what in the world then can they pass down? Why do you do what you do? They don't have anything to, to pass to their children. So you can see what that generation is going to be. You see what it is already. Well, now you can see what that generation will be as they look for why. You know, why do we do what we do, you know? I thought that was just so sad. He said, no, we don't use it. He didn't admit it. No, no, we don't use that. <laughs> I pass the preachers on current things. <laughs> Oh my goodness, well, can you get any more current than the book of Revelation? I don't think so, amen. We're living in those very times coming upon us, amen. Verse 20, when thy son asketh thee in time, what, in time saying, what meaneth? Mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded you. Verse 21, then thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Now again, he clearly is always reminding them. Now that really is, you know, that Sabbath was given to them not only uh, that they were sanctified, but uh, Moses here lets them know that the reason that they did had that Sabbath day every week was that was a reminder to them that they were bondmen in Egypt. You already read it. Look back. I think it's in chapter five. Let's turn back. Um, um, look at the twelve, chapter five, verse twelve. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it, set it apart, holy, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Now again, the Bible clearly tells us that this was a sign for the nation of Israel. Amen. This is for them. For them. Uh, Ezekiel 20, 20. Uh, I think Exodus 31 Exodus 31, 12, a sign for them. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gates, that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. And remember that thou was a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. So every week they had a reminder that was to remember that there used to be a time when we were bond men in Egypt. And now here we have a complete day a rest wherein we're not to do any work. Every day of their life be a statue, perpetual uh, covenant with them throughout all of their generations. Now we know they violated this and several of the other Sabbaths. That's why they came in, the Syrians came in and took them out. The Babylonians came in and took them out because they violated these Sabbaths. But the thing is that that was something that they would remember every week that God delivered them that they were bondmen and now how God had redeemed them. And so, uh, and that's why so readily we can take, uh, use that and make application to our own redemption. What God is doing. Notice that we go back here to 621 and the Lord brought us out. Amen. He brought them. He paid the price. The blood. He redeemed them. That's what redemption is. Amen. He brought them out of Egypt. And I was thinking that, you know, today as I was you know, rethinking and looking through these things. You know, just like we don't meet on a Sabbath day, but the first day of the week because the Lord Jesus Christ rose. And, um, you know, we get busy about church. There's a lot of things that we have to do and make preparations and come and drive and things like that. But just like he wanted them to remember that you used to be bondmen and now everything that you experience when you go into the promised land and you get this land you didn't work for, you didn't have a dream about, uh, you never even thought about all these houses, all of these uh, vineyards, you know, all of this uh, land flowing with milk and honey. 
He said, once a week, I want you to remember you used to be a bond man. I don't want you to do any work. Everybody in your house, your cattle, everything, shut it down. I want you to remember that once a week, what I did for you, bring you out and bring you into this special place. And so I was thinking about that very same thing for you and I, you know, every Sunday. We get busy and we get busy about the, the process of coming to church and, you know, myself included and all of the responsibilities that we have and things that we have to do. But do we stop and think, at least once a week, do we stop and think what the resurrection of Jesus Christ means to us personally? See, what he really did for us. Again, we're reading through many of these things now. We're preaching through the book of Romans, being re-reminded of all of these things, what God did for us through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But what the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ means to you and I, Personally, how he brought us out, how he delivered us from bondage, you know, and uh, what that means to us today. What are the things that we are enjoying today, having been saved uh, and having been uh, taken, the Bible says, from the kingdom of darkness and translating the kingdom of light? And do we stop to really think and meditate? You know, I had to ask myself, what well, do I think on this? at least once a week. And this course should be the day we think about it, amen? We're reminded of it. That's why we come to church because so many things get busy throughout the week, you know, we get, our minds get crowded, but we come on Sunday because we want to be reminded of what it is the Lord Jesus Christ did for us and the great place that we find ourselves in, even though there may be circumstances about us, you know, troubles, storms, things like that. That's just life. You know, the problems of life. We all have them. But yet once a week, can we be reminded? Not, I mean, and not just cursory thoughts, but do we stop and have some time where we just meditate and, and just deeply think upon these things? And I'm sure during that time, you know, it would be a time when they would thank the Lord for what he had brought them out and what he had done for them. And you know how eventually, if you aren't careful, those types of things in uh, you become kind of callous toward those things, you know, and you just take it for granted. You know, again, this is how it always was, so forth and so on. But it wasn't always this way, man. We didn't always have it as good as we got it uh, in our life and our responsibility and our blessings with the Lord, amen. All right, we'll stop right here, uh, then in verse number 21.